Hi, book two. Welcome to Jackie's Reading Corner. And I'm going to do a tag for you guys today in honor of the season, even though it does not feel like autumn. In fact, it feels more like summer right now. All up and, like, all up and down the East Coast, it's like in the 80s and 90 degree. Um, or, so, but it is officially autumn, so I'm going to do the fall... It's finally fall book tag, which I believe was originally created by Sam from Sam's Nonsense. Although, I believe her channel, she's taking a break from YouTube. So, I don't know if if she's ever coming back or not. I really hope she does because I like I like her channel. I mean, I think she's still going to make videos every so often. Um, so, here is It's Finally Fall book tag. Question number one. The air is crisp and clean. Name a book with a very vivid setting. And I chose Sarah Waters' is The Little Stranger. This is set post-World War, I want to say World War II, and it is a ghost story. So there's already an atmospheric setting that's creepy and a little unsettling. You have this, our main character, a middle, um, middle-class doctor, he is treating... A servant that is a resident at the house in the beginning of the book, and he becomes intertwined with the spam with the family that lives there. And this, the um, the one male family member, because it's a it's a mother and her two children, a boy and a girl. And the son is taken over his father's position in the family, but he's not very good at it. And he slowly is having a bit of a mental breakdown, and he starts to believe that he is being that the house is being haunted. He is being haunted, so it creates this creepy, like I said, unsettling atmosphere, and you don't know if there really is a ghost, or if maybe it's the ki the young man's. Maybe he's actually just going crazy. Maybe he's just imagining things. But it's just, it's, it's very unnerving. And on top of that, you're in this huge old estate. So it makes it even more creepy because there's so many rooms and so much space in the house. So that is my vivid setting. The next question, question number two. Nature is beautiful, but also dying. Name a beautifully written novel but deals with a heavy topic like grief or loss. Now, my original answer is I was going to give what I was practicing, because that's what I like to do. I like to practice before I do these tags. My original answer was going to be Pet Cemetery by Stephen King. But even though it deals with a heavy topic, it's not... I wouldn't say Stephen... I wouldn't describe Stephen King's writing as beautiful. It's more, like, straight to the point. More... Um, not even, not like, like Hemingway, where Hemingway's writing was kind of, the only way I could think of is staccato for Hemingway, but, because there is description, it's not, it's not, like, then this happened, and this, then this happened, it is, I mean, it is very descriptive, and especially with the characters, but I wouldn't, like I said, I would not call his writing beautiful. So what I ended up choosing was Chloe Benjamin's The Immortalist. This is about four siblings living in New York, and they find the oldest, the older brother finds out that there is a psychic who can predict how old you will be and the, the how the date of your death and how old you'll be when you die. And each and these four siblings go to see her. And they all find out, perhaps separately, when they're going to die. And it's all about how that affects them. Their reactions to that piece of knowledge. And the big question this book asks is, I feel like, is, is it good to know that information? Whether you believe it or not? Because, I mean, of course not everybody's going to believe that. But some people will believe if a psychic tells you. And a lot of, and there are a lot of psychics that are good at convincing you whether they are legit or not. And 
And even if you don't, you say you don't believe, maybe it still will, could potentially get inside your head. And there's also the idea if, if you know this information, then you, it will, it will manipulate how you live your life. You could either live in fear and anticipation of that day, or you could live your life to the fullest. And just knowing, know, and have in the back of your mind that eventually, at some point, you're going to die. But until then, do what you can to just live your life. Like, um, a line that makes me think of this book is one from one of my favorite, one of my favorite, um, movies. I can't remember what it's called. I know that Kathy Bates is in it. And what's her name from the woman from Black Woman from Getting Away with Murder, How to Get Away with Murder. She's the main character. Um, she's in it. Well, and it's, like, about these two families, and, of course, and, well, um, the two women, the two matriarchs of the family, Kathy Bates' character and the other woman's character, form this very strong bond, and Kathy Bates, there's a line that Kathy Bates says to the other woman, that the other woman eventually quote, quotes when her character dies, that she had asked her, are you really living, or are you just existing? And that makes me think of this book, the idea of, well, that, not having the information of your death, knowing we're gonna, when you're going to die, will that, will that motivate you to live your life, or will, or are you just going to not live at all and just exist in the world? And there was another book I read this month that kind of poses that question, um, and that was How to Stop Time, where this character, our main character, Tom, he, he wasn't immortal, but his DNA did allow him to see more by living. He aged a lot slower than most people, than everybody else. So, and because of his fears of people thinking, you know, like, his mother gets accused of witchcraft. Because they, you know, they notice he's not aging. And, like, some people wouldn't believe him, would freak out, and, you know, he's worried about... If people found out, it would become a witch hunt. And that's kind of... And so he just lives a life kind of just existing. Lives his life in hiding. Because he's afraid of how people will react if they found out that he aged slower. They would think he's immortal, that he has magic powers or something. And he was afraid. So it's not exactly the same thing, but it kind of deals with the same idea of... Will you live your life? Or are you just going to exist in the world? So, next question, question number three. Um, fall is back to school season. Name a nonfiction that has taught you something. Well, I've only read one nonfiction. And it wasn't about, well, it was a true crime novel, so I don't know if you consider that nonfiction. I mean, it's based on real events. So, I don't know if you would consider that something, like, I already, what, what happened, the crime, and, a lot of the themes, all the things unexplored, and the, the, you know, it was something that I already, I already know, and I already understand, and I already agree that it's wrong, it's so, it didn't really teach me anything new. I just liked the book, and liked how it was written. So, like I said, I don't know if it's considered, I mean, I think true crime is, is considered non-fiction, because it's based on an actual crime that was committed, and it's a narrative version of that crime. So I don't really have an answer for it. It was in Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I don't remember the author's name, and I don't have the book. Like, I try to answer these, when I do these tags, I try to pick answers. When it's one of the one of the tags where you you could show the, bo show the book that is your answer, I always try to stick to ones that I have the book, I still have the book of my possession. So I thought my mom was home. But, nope. Um, so. Next is question number four. In order to keep warm, it's good to good to spend time with family. Name a fictional family how, household that you want or wish to be part of. Oh, maybe my, maybe my mom's home. She's back in the garage or something. I don't know. Um, 
that you wish to be a part of. And, okay, this is one of those exceptions where I don't have the book, but it was the only one I could think of because the families in that story kind of reminded me, make me, made me think of Harry Potter. I mean, I imagine a lot of middle grade fantasy, a lot of young adult and middle grade fantasy were inspired by Harry Potter. And that is the families, and I don't remember their names. The families in the Keepers of the Lost City series, which is basically a middle grade series about this girl who discovers that she is an elf. And she has to go live in the world of the elves. And it turns, although it gets a little more complicated than that, of course. And, you know, there's the whole show, they have the chosen one trope in the story. And, um, and the family, the couple that takes in and adopts Sophie are so, are so awesome. And they are warm and welcoming. And, I mean, who, you know, who want to be part of a family that catches mythological creatures and, you know, takes care of them? That's essentially what they do. Like, unicorns, Bigfoot, elf horns, all those creatures, all those mythical creatures that we here in this world don't believe in. They take, they find them and take care of them and treat them and all, and, like, there's an elf horn, which is kind of like a unicorn. It's half Pegasus, half unicorn. Um, and then dinosaurs, they even have dinosaurs. And they are, so they seem like such fun, warm, welcoming people. And, you know, you also kind of want to, if you were their child, I feel like you would kind of want to help them out because they lost a child. So you want to, you would want to be there for them. And then the other family, she kind of gets to know are very much remind me of the Weasleys, although they don't have many kids. They, like, have three kids. But they also are so warm and welcoming and just... just, I I don't know. The only two adjectives I can... Adverbs or adjectives. I was never good at grammar. I mean, I was never good at grammatical grammar. I don't remember what adjectives and adverbs mean. Um... But those are the only two words I can think of to describe these fam these families. Warm, welcoming, fun people, very understanding. And they're very, they're willing, they're doing whatever it takes to help Sophie. The main character. And plus, they have really good food. Which does not look good, but if you try it, it's really good. Um... Oh, and it's by, what's the author's name? I can't remember the author's name. Um, I'm not sure what it is. I don't remember, but it's called The Keepers of the Lost City Series, the first, um, okay, so anyway, question number, that was question number Four, question number five. Fall is the perfect time for for a story by the fireplace. Name a book where someone is telling a story. Now, this is not a cozy story. It's very different from the story. The answer I picked last year, very different. But I'm going to say If We Were Villains by M.L. Rio. This is about a young man who is was arrested for the murder of one of his college friends. And how and basically the detective who arrested him is starting to wonder if he really did commit it. So commit the crime. So he decides one last time when the kid is getting out of prison to talk to the kid and to hear the real story. That's where the story, telling the story part comes into play. So it's not all cozy and sitting by the fire hearing fun adventure story. It's like a kind of more like a thriller. Like some of you would probably be something you might want to read like this time of year actually. I mean it wouldn't be perfect for this time of year. Um at least that storytelling aspect is again the young man telling the story of what happened, narrating what happened that up until up to that night when the murder was committed. Oh, and if you like Shakespeare, you might if you whether you like Shakespeare or you just love theater, you might enjoy that. You'll probably enjoy this story. But it's kind of the way it's set up is kind of like 
it's still written, it's still written like a novel, but each chapter, instead of being chapter one, chapter two, it's scene one, scene two. Um, anyway, question number six. Question number six. Nights are getting darker. Name a book that is dark and gloomy. And again, another one that I don't have the book in my possession. I didn't want to say me Stephen King. And at first I thought maybe I'll say Bowman in Black, which is something that I do have, but when I was reading it, it did not feel more like there was no I was not creeped out by it. I was more frustrated and me like I wanted to know is this guy a ghost or not kind of thing. Um, so I didn't put that one. But I ended up choosing The Winter People by Jennifer McMahon. This is, I don't know if it's a ghost story. I can't remember if it's a ghost story or not. But basically, it takes place in, um, years ago, this, a woman and her daughter, her little daughter, woman's little daughter gets lost in the woods of a Vermont cottage and years later history essentially repeats itself although I don't think it's the daughter I think it's the girl or I think it's a girl's mom that goes missing and it's all about the girl our protagonist trying to piece together what happened and why this is happening and sees the connection through a diary that she has discovered because they're I believe she and her mom and her sister are living in the same house or something. Or, like, she's connected, her mom's connected to these people. So, it's, first of all, it's in Vermont. Up in, so that's, like, up in the mountains. So, it's very isolated in a woodsy area. So a girl goes missing. It's suspenseful. It's thrilling. There is a bit of a ghost story atmosphere to it as well. Um, so, I feel like that is what makes it really creepy and dark and mysterious and not knowing what's going to happen. Um, question number seven. The days are getting colder. Name a short and heartwarming read. Okay, so originally I was going to say one that I didn't have, and that was Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. Um, because that is like a coming of age, a very much a coming of age story. In fact, it makes me think a little bit, a little, a little bit, of Little Women by Louisa May Alcott. And it's basically about this young girl's life in the early 1900s, early 20th century, and it's all about her growing up in New York, growing up poor, and how her family gets by, and how she wants to be a writer. And one of the things that really, one of the things I will say this before I get to the actual answer, um, that really bugged me in that book is the girl wanted to be a writer, so she decided to write about real life, perhaps in her, in her real life. Her dad's an alcoholic, he doesn't have, he can't keep a job. Um, her mom has to do a lot to take care of her and her brother. They don't have much, they're very poor, they don't have the greatest life. And she decides to write about them because it's what she knows. And they always tell writers, write what you know. But then, like, her teacher, you know, at first she's like, okay, this is good, this is interesting. But then her teacher's like, okay, you need to stop writing about stuff. You need to write about things more fluffy and happy and fun and whimsical and whatever. And it's like, that's not what she wants to write. She wants to write about real life and this is her real life. Which, it's like, you're gonna, you can't sugarcoat this What? Like, it frustrated because it's like the teacher was basically saying, oh, you can't talk about this. It's not very nice stuff. You need to talk about something nice and more pleasant. Because this won't, you can't get this public. This won't do well. And it's like, if you see me, it's like, really? I mean, I understand someone preferring to read more happy stories and more fluffy stories and, you know, but th that kind of stuff does even better. Like, especially nowadays, I would love to, like, I mean, if I could, like, get sucked into the story, I would just love to show this book. I would love to tell this show the books that I read and show this woman that, guess what? These are very popular books in the world. Like, they, they're they not whimsical. They're not fluffy and light and family-friendly sometimes. They're, 
they're beyond, they're gritty, they're real, they're, you know, they're not about the niceties of life. Of course, this was also during a time when the war was starting, but it just, it's like, now, I don't know, I do wonder if that was based on the author's real life a little bit, and maybe that happened to her, maybe someone told her that she was never going to be successful because she needs to write fluffy, nice pieces, and just nice works of her story, and not these gritty tales, these gritty dark tales. So, I didn't have, anyway, I did not have Tree Grows in Book 1 anymore, because as much as I enjoyed it, you know, and, I mean, if I want to read it again, I can always get it from the library. But it's not like my all-time favorite book. I mean, I, it's hard, but I do try to limit to my all-time favorite books. So, when I ended up, I decided to, um, the one I chose for a heartwarming read is Charles Dickens' is, um, although I could, I could say Oliver Twist too, but I'm in the middle of reading that, is Charles Dickens' is, a Christmas Carol. Yeah, I have this, although I've been buying in the mass market paperbacks, or at least the paperback edition of these book, these novels, because this is hard. You cannot travel with this book. It's very difficult. So I do want to get, um, I've got Oliver Twist from the library, so I won't own that one. I mean, maybe if I really, really love it, I might, but, you know, so far, yeah, I'm enjoying it, but I don't see myself being, like, absolutely having to buy, have to buy a copy. Um, but David Copperfield. I do have an Illustrated Classics edition, which is an abridged version, I believe, of his, of David Copperfield, so. Um, but that one I could, I might buy someday. Um, if it's at the bookstore, if it's at the given bookstore. But anyway, um, what was I going to say? Okay, so. A Christmas Carol. This is, I mean, this is one you read, I feel like it's a perfect to read this time of year. It's a Christmas story. So it's one of his, he's written more than one Christmas story, but I don't know about his other Christmas stories. I think David Copperfield was written, he published that around Christmas time. But it is, in case you don't know what you, if you don't know, you're probably living under a rock. This is one of the most famous Dickens. I mean, there are so many movie adaptations. It comes on every year in Christmas. It's, you're gonna find it on TV on some channel somewhere. Um, it is a story about this old mire, this miserly old man who is he runs a bank or something, and he his partner died the year died a few months ago and he is visited by his partner's ghost who tells him he is going to be visiting three spirits ghosts of christmas past christmas present and christmas future and these ghosts basically in one night tell try to help scrooge see the light and become a better person by showing him his past, his potential future, and showing him what's going on in the present with all the other people in his life. And it is a bit creepy, but it's also, it also leaves warm and fuzzy feelings, at least for me anyway. It's a classic, I feel, even though I didn't read the actual novel until a few years ago, I've only seen the movie version, I've seen a play version where my dad was my dad was cast as the Ghost of Christmas Present years ago. And it's just, I feel like it's a very heartwarming Christmas story, you know, about redemption and trying to be a better, kinder person and the meaning of Christmas to people. And there's also a lot of people in the story that aren't wealthy, they can't have all these nice things. Like, they're, you know, like what I have. They, but even though they're not rich, they're not wealthy, they still appreciate what they have and enjoy Christmas and make it a happy time. And it's just, the message is heartwarming. The message itself is so heartwarming, and it's just it's such a great Christmas. And I, it's one of those stories I definitely want to read to my nephews when they get old enough. 
I know that like I can I cannot read this edition to them, but I want to get them edition an edition that I can read to them, or at least I hope my sister does at some point get them. Maybe from the library, borrow one from the library, or borrow like or get a um, or like buy the book for them, or someone buys it for them, and a nice edition with beautiful illustrations of that story. Because I think every little kid should experience that story. Okay. Question number eight. Fall luckily returns every year. Name a favorite you'd like to return to. Um, I the one that I've been thinking most about returning to is don't lose that bookmark. Is this one, The Night Circus by Aaron Morgan? I've been meaning returning return to this book, and the funny thing is, I got into this book long before book two, and. I read it, and it had been years since I read it the first time. I still kept it because I had intended to read it again at some point. And then all of a sudden, like, I joined BookTube two years ago, and I'm all of a sudden hearing about it from some of my favorite BookTubers, like Sam from Thoughts on Tomes. And it's like, wow, so there's other people that really love this book. And to the point where I think a lot of people want to see, first of all, they want to see another book by the author, which is happening, actually, or it's going to be published. Um, her one, not once upon a river, is it once upon a river? No, I think once upon a river is Diane Thunderfield's book. Um, the Starless Sea is the one by Erin Morgan, sorry. And it's her first book since she published this one, and this public, this came out, like, What's the copyright date of this book? Um, where is it? Yeah, this came out in 2011. Oh, but I guess my edition is a 2012 edition. First Anchor Books, but it was originally published in 2011, so that must be when the hardback came out. Because hardback always comes out first in the U.S., which I totally think is unfair, because hardbacks are expensive, and I get why they have to charge a little bit more, but, like, come on, can't you put out both? But I think this is just a way for them to get money, to force people to, because they know they're going to buy it right away, so they'll buy, the, they'll waste the money and buy the hardback. And only the people that are uncertain but are interested, we'll buy the paperback. But anyway, this is the book I want to reread. I also like to reread Crime and Punishment, which I read this year. But I need to get, read some other Russian authors first before I reread that one. Um, this is basically about a circus that comes during the nighttime, and it's the backdrop for these two magicians that were planned preordained to compete with each other by like their father figures or their masters or whatever and it turns into a bit of a romance and I do remember there was also a plot of this other young man in a more um, and how he's kind of connected and he's always been fascinated by the by this magical circus and so weird. I just remember falling in love with the writing and really getting lost in the atmosphere. So I need to reread this again. I think I might reread this in December. But it was so cool, like finding out that other that a lot of people really love love this book on BookTube. Okay, question number. Where did it go? Okay, um, question number. Nine is I don't know why I said five. Okay. Question number nine. Fall is the perfect time for cozy night. Name your favorite cozy cozy reading test or reading. Um I don't really have one. I mean I like wearing socks, like little cute little socks. And um I would take out the blanket but 
as you, like I said, it feels like summer here, so I don't want to take that up because it's going to be hot. Um, but I have these two blankets I got last year that I really liked. I like using, so and I will probably curl up with those. So I don't really have a favorite. Okay, so this is the one where I have to take a minute to set this up. Um, so question number 10 is, colorful leaves are piling on the ground. Show us a pile of colored spine, fall colored spines. So give me a minute. Let me go with this one. No. Gina Starborn. Mm. Can you see it? Right there. There it is. Well, I've got a yellow, a red, another red, another yellow, and then I threw in a brown one. Can you see it? Brown, yellow, red, red, yellow. I have a lot of mass market because it was always like I always bought mass market until I got a job because they're cheap. And they're small, they're very portable. Okay, so that's it. That is the fall, finally fall book tab. Like I said, I think it was created by Sam from Sam's Nonsense. I will post a link to her original video or at least someone's video. Because like I said, I think she's stepped back from booktube. Um, I don't know if her channel is still in, in existence or not. I hope it is. If not, I will post someone's video of this. So I will talk to you guys. So if you guys like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and click subscribe if you haven't already. And once again, I hope you are enjoying your reading, and I will talk to you all later. Alright, bye!